welcome to Rehoboth. We're so glad you're here today. Shall we stand together and let's sing praises to the Lord. I am the Prince of Peace. As I said to my disciples, I say also to you, peace be with you. Since I am your constant companion, my peace is steadfastly with you. When you keep your focus on me, you experience both my presence and my peace. Worship me as King of Kings, Lord of Lords, and Prince of Peace. You need my peace each moment to accomplish my purposes in your life. Sometimes you are tempted to take shortcuts in order to reach your goal as quickly as possible. But if the shortcuts require turning your back on my peaceful presence, you must choose the longer route. Walk with me along paths of peace. Enjoy the journey in my presence. Let us pray. Dear God, thank you for this beautiful day, the cold, crisp air, the beautiful sunshine, everything that we need, you have for us. We celebrate you on the second Sunday of Advent, awaiting the birth of our Savior. Open our ears and our hearts this morning as Pastor Mike brings us your message and lead us out into the world to share it with all those around us. In your name we pray, amen. You may be seated. <laughs> Micah 5.2 five, Micah five says, but you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are too small to be among the army groups from Judah, from you will come one who will rule Israel for me. He comes from very old times, from days long ago. We relight the prophet's candle, knowing we have true hope.
The second candle is the Bethlehem candle, or the candle of peace. The story of Mary and Joseph's journey is well known to us, but doesn't sound like a very peaceful event. This humble couple has to suddenly take an 80-mile trip from Nazareth to a tiny town outside of Jerusalem, and at a terrible time for Mary to, Mary to be traveling any sort of distance. Still they went. Peace in the case of the Bethlehem journey isn't quietness. It's a peace of mind that no matter what happened, the protection of God was with them. From Bethlehem, we know that God can do great things out of what otherwise seems insignificant. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, you chose Bethlehem for Jesus to be born, not some large grand city like many expected the Messiah to come from, but in a small town out in the stable of an inn. Through the Bethlehem story, we know your peace is a comfort, even if we don't always understand what you have planned. Be with us that we can spread your peace to those around us. Amen. Now we invite the children to come on up and meet with Miss Louise. I know you probably were expecting me to do a magic trick today, but next time. <laughs> today I wanted to talk to you about a star. You know the star that came over Bethlehem? Well, I wrote a little story, a little poem, and it's called Shine Little Star. Okay, Miss Lisa's going to show you some pictures while I tell this. Shine, little star. What's wrong, little star? The other stars said as they gathered round the little star's bed. Why don't you shine? Where is your light? How can you help us to light up the night? I don't know, cried the star. I can't find my glow. But I was told to look at the earth down below. And there in a stable, in a manger of straw, was the sweetest baby the stars ever saw. Then, all of a sudden, the little star shook, and all the others took a long look. The littlest star began to glow, brighter and brighter on the earth below. But he couldn't stop, and he couldn't stay, till he moved to the spot where the little child lay. And there led the sh shepherds, the wise men and all, to find baby Jesus in a warm cattle stall. It seems that God was saving this little star shine for a special purpose, for a special time, to announce to the world that was so tired and worn that their Lord and Savior, Christ Jesus, was born. And do you know that God is preparing each one of you to light up the world, to let your light shine through? Just follow the Savior, take care of what you say, and you too will show Others, the Lord, every day. So Miss Lisa has some stars for you so that you can shine. How are you going to shine today? What can you do to shine? What can you do to shine? Anybody have an idea? What can you, yes. Yes. You can help people, that's right. You can help people and you can smile. I don't see smiles. I see smiles now, right. You can help at home and you can be a friend to someone. Hmm? Yes, very good. We can do all kinds of things to let our light shine through. You want to say a little prayer with me? Okay. God, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for this time of year when we celebrate his birth. Lord, help us to shine for you. All this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, you can go, you can go to Children's Church. <clears throat>
Our Old Testament scripture reading this morning comes from Psalm 119, verses 153 through 160. <clears throat> Look at my misery and rescue me, for I do not forget your law. Plead my cause and redeem me. Give me life according to your promise. Salvation is far from the wicked, for they do not seek your statutes. Great is your mercy, O Lord. Give me life according to your justice. Many are my persecutors and my adversaries, yet I do not swerve from your decrees. I look at the faithless with disgust because they do not keep your commands. Consider how I love your precepts. Preserve my life according to your steadfast love. The sum of your word is truth, and every one of your right, righteous ordinances endures forever. Our New Testament reading today comes from Matthew chapter 9, verses 35 through 38. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. 
Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Now, if you'll please stand and greet one another. Good morning. So uh, what I think of as one of the most underrated gifts I ever gave the boys when they were little for Christmas was a pair of night vision goggles. Now they were cheap. They weren't military grade or anything. They were, they were cheap. They came from like the National Ge Geographic store or something. And I was fascinated by them. The boys hardly had any use for them, but I loved the idea. We tried playing hide and seek and you can't hide from somebody with MVGs. You just, you can see everything. They're, they're crouched and they think nobody can, because it's dark, but you can see them. I, uh, in recent weeks, uh, for those of you that are hunters and hunt in the afternoon or evening, you know, the deer don't start coming out until it is just about dark. How many of you have sat there and thought, oh, if I just had some night vision goggles, this would be so much easier, Right? It's called spotlighting. That's the old school way of doing it. Well, don't do it. It's illegal. And uh, if you're caught, this is going to be a big fine. Well, the series that we're in is uh, looking at, at God, um, who has a number of names that we've given him uh, throughout, throughout history. And uh, the gift, each gift is uh, connected to the name. So to us, from God who sees today. El Roy is, uh, is the, a name given to him, and it means the God who sees. And that story comes from, uh, it's a story from the saga of Abraham. If you've ever read Genesis, um, there's a big chunk of it that's dedicated to the story of Abraham. And um, just a quick review, Abraham was living in, in this land um, with his family, and one day this god, he was a moon, uh, moon worshiper. He worshiped the moon god. And uh, this god, who nobody had really even heard of or knew about, appears to Abraham and says, leave your country, leave this land, leave your family, and go to this other land in the south that I'm going to show you when you get there. And when you get there, I'm going to give you that land. And I'm going to make your descendants like as many as the stars in the sky and the sands of the sea. And you and your, you and your family will be a blessing to all the families of the earth. What a wonderful blessing, right? Just head south. I'll give you the land. And you will have a multitude, a multitude of descendants. And they will be a blessing to the earth. Well, he got up and he left. And he headed south. It was quite a journey. And uh, he got there. And, you know, there were a couple of challenges when he arrived. First was, he wasn't the first one there. There were people already living in his land. And he's like, what am I supposed to do? And also, he had no children at all to begin with. And there he is. He's got no children. He doesn't own the land, really. And he's getting older. Well, 10 years pass. No children. Still doesn't own the land. Uh, still living out this, in this promise that God had given him, this new God that he barely knew. And still no kids. All he had, he had become wealthy. He had become very wealthy. And he had a number of servants or, or slaves that were working for him. And uh, one of them was a, a gal named Hagar, who was an Egyptian slave. And she really belonged to his wife, Sarah. And, you know, Sarah, who really just kind of got dragged along, wherever, if God told Abraham to go, Sarah had to go with him. And here they are. They've been living 10 years. They're both getting older, and uh, Sarah's frustrated. She's, she's got no kids. You said God was going to give us kids, and here I am. Clearly, God has given us no kids. She says, well, I've been thinking about it. 
This is one night, probably just the two of them, in the, in the quiet of the night, when, when all the other servants have left the room, she says, I've been thinking about it. Why don't you take Hagar, my, my, my servant, go into her? Maybe, maybe God will give me children through her. It doesn't sound like a great option, does it? Right? It's, she's, your, she's your slave. Your husband is going to have sex with her. She, if she gets pregnant, you're going to take that slave girl's child and raise it as your own to some extent, right? Not, not a good option to begin with. But Abraham said, well, I love my wife and I love her ideas. I think he liked this idea. Um, and so, sure enough, he, th- the Bible says he took Hagar as his wife. Now, some translations say concubine, which is like a secondary wife. It's, there's wives, and then there's secondary wives, um, and then there's like mistresses. Like, so concubine is kind of a secondary, almost as good as wife, but not quite. Uh, he takes her and uh, begins treating her as a concubine, and sure enough, she gets pregnant. And uh, the, tr- the problem here is Hagar, she didn't stop being Sarah's servant. She didn't, st- she didn't stop working for Sarah. Now, here she is. She's pregnant. She's never, she's, she's, she doesn't want to be here. She was made a slave by, by these two or wh- whoever gave the, her to them. She's never going to see her family again, never going home again. She's got to serve these people day in and day out. She doesn't particularly like her. She doesn't like Sarah particularly, and now she's pregnant. Well, as you might expect, she began to develop a little bit of an attitude. I don't know how much of an attitude, but, you know, every time Sarah says, go boil the water for dinner, and she's got, she's like, okay, I'll I'll do it. You know, she's thinking to herself, she can do it. Why can't she do it? So she starts to put a little bit of bass in her voice. She's like, sure, mistress. And she's looking at her, and you know, like there's attitude. And at first it's a little, but then it starts to be a a little more and a little more. And Sarah catches it. She catches it right away. And Sarah doesn't like that attitude she's putting in her tone. She doesn't like the way she's looking at her. And the anger starts to build up, and she gets angrier. And finally, just one day, she storms out to the field, where Abraham is, is with the animals, and she says, everything that's being done to me is on you, mister. It's on you, and it's your fault. And he's like, well, what? what? What happened? She said, that girl back there is pregnant, and I don't like the way she's looking at me. You got her pregnant. It's all your fault. Let the Lord judge between us. Now, men, right? I mean, we dare not even say it out loud. This isn't my fault. It's your fault. It's your idea. I was just doing as you told me to do. Now what, what, what you told me to do has happened. And, but Abraham wisely, like we often do, we stay silent. He stayed silent. And rather than point out reason and logic in the moment, well, I get myself in trouble every week, don't I? There's always somebody mad at me. He, uh, rather than, than point out reason and logic, he punts. He backs up and he punts. He says, well, she's your, she's your slave girl, and she's in your power. You do to her as you please. Right? And that's exactly what Sarah does. She begins to treat her harshly, begins to, begins to make it harder on her. The, the tone is harder. She's yelling. She's impatient. The critical, it's just, it's just getting worse and worse and worse. This story, it, this is not a fun story. It just, it starts bad and gets from, it, well, it starts wonderful. God makes a promise. You're going to have a child. You're going to have a whole bunch of children. But it just keeps getting worse and worse and worse. You know, when, when you start to go, when you start to go wrong, when things start to go bad, stop. When you find yourself in a hole, stop digging. I'm just throwing this in for free right now. So, this is 20 years ago, maybe 15 years. It's so embarrassing to even tell, but it works. I was at the Frederick County Public Library. Anybody ever been there? It's a beautiful building. They built it. It's, it's still relatively new. They've got a big parking garage you can park in. And as you leave, it's a tight, it's a tight turn. 
to get out of there. And one day we were leaving. We had bought a, a minivan because we had three kids now. And, you know, it was a little bit bigger than the car we had been driving. You know where this is going. And as I started to turn right out of there, a truck was coming in. And I was like, oh. And I had to move over a little bit more. And no sooner did I move over a little bit more, <clears throat> I heard the sound. <coughs> and it was this. I mean, my reaction time was quick. <coughs> oh, oh. I knew what I had done immediately. I knew I had hit the corner of the brick wall, and I wasn't the first one by the looks of it. I had hit the corner with about midway back on the van, on our newish van. I was so angry with myself. I taught myself a lesson. I just kept going. I could have stopped. I could have stopped and backed up and readjusted, but that truck was coming in, and I was already furious with myself, so I just kept going. We had, uh, we had that van for another two years. I never fixed it. <laughs> that was one, one of the low points in my marriage with Grace. I mean, she's right there watching me. Do, what an idiot. When you s find yourself in a hole, stop digging. These two, Abraham and Sarah, <clears throat> they've gotten themselves in a hole. They started making decisions. They, they should have just waited on God. That's all you had to do is wait on God. God had, but they didn't know God that well. They, God had promised. All they had to do was wait. What I love about the Bible, especially the old, well, the whole Bible, I love, we think all these characters are going to be like perfect, holy and righteous all the time and without flaw and, and hard for us to connect with. But they're not. They are so flawed. Jacob last week was so flawed. Abraham is so flawed. Sarah's the worst of the good guys in the Bible. She's the worst. I love it that the Bible's so honest. Well, okay, as I was saying, hey, Sarah started making that life harder for Hagar. Hagar said, I've had enough. I quit. And she ran away. Now, she's a slave girl. She did, can't run away, but she ran away. She's thinking, I can escape, right? I mean, because she's seven months pregnant, right? Eight months, whatever. She's, she's with child. She's running and running and running. She gets a distance away. She's going to take her chances out in the wilderness. And she, she finds a spring, and she stops, and she's resting by the spring, and an angel of the Lord appears to her. This is unintentional, but this series that we're in through Advent and into Christmas, every week we have an angel in the story. I didn't mean to do it, but you're welcome. The angel of the Lord. And people will ask, is it the, who is this? I think it's God in a human form. Maybe, maybe a Christ-like, maybe it's Jesus. I, I don't think it's just an angel. It's an angel of the Lord. I think it's an angel. Appears to her by the stream. And says, Hagar, slave girl, slave girl of Sarah, where have you come from and where are you going? It's interesting that she calls her not Hagar the Egyptian, but Hagar the slave girl of Sarah. That's her identity now. Hagar, slave girl of Sarah, where have you come from and where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress, Sarah. No hesitation at all. The angel of the Lord says, no. Return to your mistress and be obedient to her. Submit to her. I love the practicality in the angel of the Lord here. Right? Like the angel of the Lord could say, no, you're right, girl. Just keep going. Keep on running. You're... But the angel of the Lord knows, you're eight months pregnant. You're not going to survive out here in the wilderness. You can't stay by this spring forever. Go back. Be a good girl. But don't worry, because I will so greatly multiply your offspring spring, that they can't be counted. You've conceived, and you will bear a son, and you will name him Ishmael, which means God hears. Because the Lord has heard your affliction, Ishmael will be a wild ass of a man with his hand against everyone and everyone against him, and he will live at odds with all of his kin. What a wonderful blessing. What a wonderful prophetic statement of my son that, that is not yet born yet, but I'm about to have. He's going to be a wild ass of a man. Great. But the real point of the blessing is, and there will be many and many and many of them. So go back, have that baby, 
and wait. I'll take care of it. So sure enough, she returns. I like that. She returns, and she, she does the best she can working for this boss she doesn't like. Anybody ever work for a boss they didn't like? Right? And you're like, I would quit, which happened through the pandemic, right? Everybody quit. I'm done with this. And now they're like, oh, I wish I had my job back, right? Well, some are happy. Some, a lot aren't, though. She goes back. But, well, before she leaves, she says to the angel of the Lord, I love this. He just, God has just said to her, you'll name him Ishmael. That means God hears. His name will be God hears. And she says, you are El Roy. For I have seen you and I have lived. She says, you are the God who sees. Name the boy God hears. And she says, but you are your God sees because I've seen you and I've lived. I love that his name, God's name, in this one story is both God hears and God sees. Well, she gave birth to Ishmael, sure enough, and time passed. About 14 years. If you read the Bible and you look at the numbers properly, it's about 14 years go by, and Abraham raised Ishmael as his own because he was his own. And eventually, Sarah did become pregnant. And she had a son also, who she named Isaac. And, you know, I'm not sure the weaning process of, of the ancient of days, but, you know, around two or three years old, the boy is weaned. And so Abraham has a birthday, a, a weaning party for Isaac. It's a big party. He invites all the, all the friends, the servants come in, everybody. Whoever's around has a, has, comes to the party. Well, Ishmael, by, by the looks of it, is 14, about 14 to 17 years old. He's, he's grown. And during the party, as big brothers will do, he began to play with his little brother. Now, if you translate it, the best you can do to translate it in a negative way is to say he was teasing his little brother. But it really just says he's, he's playing with Isaac. Ishmael is playing with Isaac, right? Big brothers, that's what we do sometimes. And sometimes we maybe tease a little too hard. I don't know if that even happened here. Whatever happened was there's a party going on, the cakes being served, the balloons and the, the jump house and everything. And Sarah looks over and she sees Ishmael playing with Isaac and something unearths in her. And she loses her mind. I don't, at first I thought she waited till I, Abraham went back to the kitchen to get some more punch and she went in there. But the more I thought about it this week, the more I was like, no, 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 no. I think she did this in front of everybody. She storms over and she's separate. Get away from him. She looks at Abraham. She says, send that slave girl and her boy out of here. I will not have my son inheriting your inheritance with that slave boy's son. That slave boy. Well, needless to say, the party was ruined. Everybody went home quickly. You know how that goes, right? Somebody loses their mind in the middle of a party. Okay, well, I think it's time we head out. We'll take a little bit of the cake to go. <laughs> Abraham is stressed out. He's cleaning up, and you can just tell. You ever been like that? Like, I mean, not, there's been a fight and maybe some embarrassment that's going on in front of everybody, and you're just cleaning up, and you're just like, what am I going to do? He's, she says, I got to get send my concubine, wife, slave girl, and her son, who is my biological son, who I've raised as my own, send them away. And he's stressed out. He knows enough about God that this is not what God would want. God would want him to raise this son that he created, right? So the angel of the Lord says to Abram, don't be distressed because of the boy and your slave woman. Do whatever Sarah tells you to do. Ooh, really? He says, it's, it's through Isaac that your offspring will come to be known by you. Everyone will come to know you as the grandfather of Isaac's children. But don't worry, as for the slave woman, I will make a nation of him also because he also is your offspring. Now, let me just time out here. It's a long story, I know. You go back to the beginning where God said, I will make 
Your children will make offspring, and they will be countless. That's the promise made by God. And then these two put, took matters into their own hands and made a child outside of wedlock. God still has to follow the promise. Like if God made the promise, God's got to live into the promise. I made a promise to you. So now, even though this child wasn't even really expected, God is going to bless it. Here's the thing about un unexpected children. They're all a blessing. They're all a blessing. <sighs> well, he says, go ahead and do what Sarah tells you to do. And if there's a low point in, in my es estimation of Abraham, it's in this point. They go to bed that night. He doesn't like it, but this is what he does. He gets up early in the morning. It's not even sun up. He's going to deal with this cowardly problem. Well, God told him to do it. He's going to deal with this cowardly problem before anybody else is up. He's going to have this problem gone before breakfast. So he goes into Hagar's tent, shakes her awake, says, get up, come outside. She goes in and gets, gets Ishmael, get up, come outside. He's got a loaf of bread and a skin of water for her throws it in a backpack, and he says, here you go, take this, and go. This is the, this is the father of, of both the Jewish and Christian faith. This is the first person that God reached out to in this kind of way, and this is what he's doing. No cart, no donkey, no flint knife, no kitchen tools, no money, no nothing. Take this bread and some water and go. Be gone before sunup. We'll deal with him another day. So Hagar leaves, and it doesn't take long in a desert area for the water to run out. I don't know how thirsty you all have ever been. I've been thirsty, but never thirsty to the point of collapsing and dying. She's that thirsty. And her 14-year-old boy, maybe he's younger. It reads as if he's younger, but he's, maybe he's 14, 15 years old. They're thirsty, and they're ready to faint. And she's looking at him, and, she, and there's just, you know, they're, it's just stumbling along in the wilderness, no water anywhere. And she takes him, and she, it, it, she throws him under a, a bush, a tree, so at least he can die in some shade. And she starts to wander off a bow shot away, so she doesn't have to listen to or see her son die. This is awful. This is an awful story. What, what, a, what are you supposed to do? And I, because I think he might be younger, but you know, there are 14-year-olds, 15, you know, like, moms are still tougher than 15-year-olds, right? Like, 15-year-olds are big, and they're strapping, and they're powerful, but the anger of a mom the will of a mom. Ladies, I thought you would amen on that, but okay, fine. <laughs> there's, there's a toughness in a woman who has a 14 or 15-year-old son, I, and that's why I think she throws him, because you're thinking he should be helping her. Well, no, he's about, he's about done for, because he doesn't have that age strength. She goes off, and she's, she doesn't even want to see it or hear it, and she just starts crying to God, just lashing out, her, her woes, everything that she is going through. And remember, his name's Ishmael, which means God hears. And sure enough, God hears her, her cries. And he yells, <laughs> he doesn't even come this time, he just yells down, girl, why are you crying? Hagar, what troubles you? Don't be afraid, for God has heard the voice of the boy. Come, lift him up and hold him fast, for I will make a great nation of him. They're both almost dead. She's now, she's now walked a bow shot away. She's got to walk all the way back. Don't worry. I've got it handled. I'm going to make a great nation. I told you that 10, 15 years ago. I'm going to make a great nation of it. And as she looks over out of nowhere, she notices there is a Hand dug well already there with water in it. The day has been saved. She fills her skin with water. She runs, drinks a little bit, I think, gets her strength back, runs back, gives him some water. They get their strength back. The two of them continue on in the wilderness, and they survive. 
Ishmael grows up into a, a I mean, he's a warrior is what he becomes. And, 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 he, and he gets, she ends up getting him a, an Egyptian wife. And sure enough, a whole nation comes from the Ishmaelites. God was, was with them through it all. Hagar names him El Roy, the God who sees. And he names his, her son Ishmael, which means God hears. You know, you can't feel seen until you've been heard. You get that, right? Do you ever feel like you're not being seen or not being heard? You can't be seen until you've been heard. Hagar was in the, in the darkness, ready to die, leaning against a tree, ready to quit, and God, who can see everything, she couldn't see it. It was there. It didn't appear. It was there. God, who can see everything, says there's your solution right there. She is ready to quit. She cries out to God, and she looks, and there it is. Whew. Have you ever been in that situation? Have you ever been ready to quit and give up, and you cry out to God, and all of a sudden, there is the situation? Because God, who sees even when we're in the dark, God sees. And sometimes we find ourselves in the dark in our own making. Of our own making, we, we put ourselves in the darkness, and we know we can't get out. And all God is looking for is a little bit of humble repentance. Just a little bit of, Lord, I have gotten myself in a mess. Get me out. Forgive me. Lead me out of this. And it's not always pleasant. The path out is sometimes just as hard as the well, twice as hard as the path. It's easy getting in usually. Sometimes it's a hard path out. But God, who sees, leads us out. And sometimes it's not our fault at all. And we find ourselves often in a situation of not of our own creation, and we have no idea how to get out of it. We don't know what to do. We don't know where to go because we're in the darkness. And God sees, and we cry out to God, and God leads us every step of the way out. And you often can't tell, right? When you're in it, you can't tell you're being let out even sometimes. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. The God who sees can see us through the valley of the shadow of darkness. And sometimes we think we're all on the... Do you ever feel like you're not being seen by others? Do you ever feel like you're just alone? Nobody sees me. Nobody speaks to me. Nobody hears me. Does anyone even know I'm alive? If I, if I stop being here, if I'm done tomorrow, would anyone even notice I was gone? Elroy sees, the God who sees, sees you. And even when you feel like you're alone, you are not alone. And you can cry out to God, and God will lead you into a place where you feel seen, where you are seen. And sometimes we have a hard time even seeing ourselves. And I, I guess if there's a favorite point of this, because there's a lot when it comes to God seeing, God sees everything. But sometimes we can't even see ourselves. I've got friends who, if they could only see what I see, and if, even better, if they could only see what God sees in them, they think to themselves, I'm no good. Right? Have you ever thought, I'm no good? Because you can't see what God sees. God who creates you, who made you the way you are, sees the potential in you that you, you have no idea what God has in store for you if you just believe in yourself. Because God sees you and believes in you. We're never by ourselves. And God sees us and knows us well and believes in us and will lead us through everything, always and forever. And with that, let's pray. Oh Lord, we thank you for this day, for your love for us, Lord, you see. You are El Roy, and you see us. You hear us. You see us when we're sleeping, and you do know when we're awake. You know if we've been bad or good. Huh. Oh, Lord, bless us today and see us today. Lead us onward. As we celebrate 
this holy meal as we prepare our hearts to celebrate and share in, in unity with each other and with you. Lord, we remember that your son Jesus, on the night before his death, gathered his disciples together and at that holy meal broke bread, gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes again in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet through your Son, Jesus Christ, with your Holy Spirit and your Holy Church. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. All right, looks like our ushers are in place. Um, so we'll be sharing communion together. We'll have two stations, one on this side and one on this side. Um, these two areas come up through the middle and then around to the outside and then in this, the same. Everyone should go that way? Oh, okay. Okay. There have been some adjustments in my mind. Come up through this, these aisles and then everybody goes around the outside. Less of a traffic jam that way.
spent was the night. Isaiah twas foretold it, the rose I have in mind. With Mary we behold it, the virgin mother kind, to show God's love of Ushers will come forward, please. We'll give our gifts to the Lord. We are going to perfect our communion technique <laughs> eventually. You know, when you've been in the same building for a hundred years, it's not a, everybody just knows what to do couple of things we want to lift up. Uh, Fran, I talked to Fran Lawrence this morning. Um, she's asking for prayers for her grandson, Brian, but also um, she's had a double whammy of, of, of illness as well, and so she said she spent the last month coughing, and so 
um, prayers for Fran and her grandson Brian. A big thank you to, um, to the ladies who decorated both our uh, sanctuary tree as well as the one in the foyer. We had uh, two different teams, and so thank you all for taking care of that um, and getting that done as well as last uh, the week before all of the other decorations. We, uh, we have a grocery giveaway coming up on Saturday from 9 a.m. to noon. If you'd like more information with that, you can reach out to the office or, the, um, or to contact Laura and Bill Eckerd directly. Also, next Sunday is the deadline for luminaries. Um, if you'd like to, have an, uh, to buy a luminary to be uh, used during Christmas Eve, the uh, order forms are due next Sunday. And there's also, you, know, you can read all about this in the bulletin, um, but there's also a bowling party that is not in the bull bulletin, but uh, those of you that have signed up for it, um, you know where and when to be, but uh, the deadline has passed for that. And so just a reminder that that's coming up. Um, I believe we had 27, 27 folks show up for that, so that should be a fun time. Um, we will be Christmas caroling on December 14th. That's a Wednesday night activity. Dinner will be served at 5.30, and we will depart at 6 p.m. in three different teams to, to visit the shut-ins of our uh, church community. And this is really open for all ages. Um, Many of you have friends here from the church, lifelong friends, who are, are homebound now. This is an opportunity to come share some Christmas joy with them and visit them. We'll be taking cookies along with us, and if, if you would like to make a batch of cookies, those will also be due um, this coming Sunday. We have a parents' night out on December 16th. That's a Friday from 6 to 9, a, a chance to go shopping and do some of your last-minute shopping as well as the opportunity to maybe just take your sweetheart out on a date in this hectic season. So you can read all about that in the bulletin as well. Um, we will need help stacking these chairs um, at the end of the service, just this side of the sanctuary. We'll stack them up and move them over to, to the mid-court line. Um, and then we were, we were going to have the... the uh, all of the stuff that's come out of the kitchen come in afterward as well, but I think we're going to wait on that, Brad, until later this week. So don't worry about the equipment that's from the kitchen, just the chairs um, right after church. And uh, this Wednesday night, we will be playing Capture the Flag for all of you young people. It will be a half court and should be a very intense uh, game of Capture the Flag. That starts at 7 p.m. Dinner will be served at 6 p.m. Also, and I think Linda's probably already taken care of this, but uh, Linda, do you need anything further with the fabrics? Um, they should meet, you, you'll take care of it. All right, so thank you, Linda. And uh, finally, I want to invite Leon up. He has a, a presentation he wants, wants to make. So if you can work your way on up here, Leon. My, the Christmas season is just uh, is flying by, isn't it? But 2022 has flown by but it has been a, a, a successful one and a blessed year. Thank you. Okay. I'll come down to you, Leon. I'm not a member yet. It's going to be, but I missed it all. Right there. Oh, there we go. There we go. So I'm going to donate to help the church with food drive and help the kids that will not have a good Christmas. So this is from my wife, deceased wife, and her family, and me, to Reverend, Mo Reverend, okay, Pastor Mike, and I know the church will do good with it. There you are, sir. I've got a microphone. Now, did you want me to read the... Uh, you can if you want to. Well, Leon, this is a wonderful gift. It's uh, $7,500 to go toward our, um, our, our, our food giveaway as well as helping kids in the area with Christmas. We appreciate you. I'm calling him Le Leon, but he's not a member yet, so I'm not really required to know his name, actually. It's Leroy. <laughs> Leroy. <laughs> Um, we're looking forward to getting to know you as a church, and uh, you all make sure you, you thank Lee, Leroy and uh, get to know him as well. Good to see you. Okay. Let's 
stand together for the Don Collins. Glory be to God the Father, glory be to Christ the Son, glory to the Holy Spirit, glory to the Three in One. Here we offer to you gladly all the gifts that you impart as we glory in your presence, giving from our grateful Thank you, Lord, for the blessings that you have bestowed on each of us. Please use the gifts that we have brought to the church in the way that you think is best for them to be used. As we go out into the week, let us look for the angels that are sent by God that lead us on the path that you would want us to be leading, being kind, being gentle, being thoughtful to all those around us. And in the words that Jesus taught us, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let us go now in the light or in the darkness, knowing that God sees and God leads us onward. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.